Hey, welcome everybody to Hope for Our Times. It is uh, Monday afternoon. It's live. Uh, with me is Bill Salas. Bill, can you hear me? I can, Tom. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'm guessing all of our viewers can hear you also. Bill's joining us by audio. By the way, Bill's going to be back uh, three weeks from today on December 6th. And uh, also two weeks from today, Billy Crone is going to be with me. Uh, but um, we have a few more equipment things. We're almost there. And uh, so we do have Bill on audio, which is quite good. And um, great to have you here. Okay, let's just, let's just get going with the program. Okay, so uh, Bill, I want to ask you, I, I've been getting a lot of different questions. I just taught through the book of Joel. And um, in there, you have different passages about Egypt and about Edom and so forth. And then we have Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 49, uh, some other passages. Bill, you're known as the expert on Psalm 83. And uh, Psalm 83, uh, the war of Damascus from Isaiah chapter 17 and so forth. Um, can you let all of our viewers know uh, what's going on in the Mideast right now? Where do you see things developing? And let me start with this. Do you think that uh, the war to remove the, the battle that's going to happen over the course of a night, uh, the way I read it, is going to happen anytime soon when it comes to Damascus? Okay, yeah. Well, let's start right there, Tom. Damascus is one of the uh, front-running prophecies that I, I think a lot of us, yourself included, are watching for that could be actually imminent at this point because, you know, Israel and, and Syria are still at war. You know, Syria has been involved in the wars of 48, 1967, 1973. And although Jordan and Egypt have treaties with Israel, fragile treaties, Syria never did. And Israel continues to strike near Damascus and other places, uh, trying to prevent the flow of weapons from Iran into Hezbollah's hands. And so they're at war, and it's a very volatile situation. I'm kind of surprised at this point that it hasn't already happened. But you're right about the prophecy. Isaiah 17.1 says Damascus, which is one of the continuously oldest inhabited cities in the world, dates back to the time of Abraham. It's going to cease from being a city. It's going to literally become a ruinous heap. And we were told who's responsible for it in Isaiah 17.9. It says in in that day, his strong cities will be forsaken, speaking, referring to Damascus and the masculine pronoun. And it says there will be desolation caused by the children of Israel, the Israeli Defense Forces, who exist today in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But here's the key, like you'd mentioned. The, the, Isaiah 17 concludes with verse 14, which says, And behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he, Damascus, is no more. This is a portion of those who plunder us and of the lot of those who rob us. Picturing Israel doing this overnight with the weaponry they have presently uh, in self-defense. You know, it's, it goes back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, 3. Those who curse Israel will be cursed. It's a curse for curse in kind. For some reason, uh, Sir, Damascus, Syria, headquartered in Damascus, is trying to rob and plunder Jerusalem, essentially, we find that it's Jerusalem in Jeremiah 49, verses 23 through 27. Uh, that cup of trembling, of course, in Zechariah chapter 12. So in self-defense, Israel has to destroy Damascus. And in, in the pre-tribulation prophecies DVD, Tom, that you and I did, we actually lay out a scenario as to why that probably has to happen and what then happens when the ramifications, but in the aftermath of that, because when taking out a major city by Israel is a big deal. They, they have to find themselves mm -hmm. locked into a real big problem to actually take them out overnight. Yeah, so let me ask you about that. In fact, I have a few passages to ask you about. There's a prophecy that speaks about uh, Egypt being uninhabited or something like that for 40 years. Um, there's a prophecy. Some, I think that's what it says. Um, and then you also have this prophecy in Joel that talks about uh, I think it's in Joel chapter 3 that talks about Egypt being uh, judged and then also Edom, but then God is going to bless Judah. And, and you know, I look at these things, and I know you've had, uh, you've had these conversations before, but I get questions. I get a question last week, and, and Bill, you actually uh, heard it because I mentioned I was talking with Vindog, and uh, you saw the video where I had a question about Lebanon and Damascus. And... Uh, and whether or not Lebanon was going to be destroyed in that 
uh, in the, at the time Damascus is. And I say, uh, I don't know. Let me ask Bill Salas, see what he has to say about that. And I think their concern was we keep hearing the talks about Hezbollah and the rockets that they're threatening to launch against Israel from the north. You know, obviously Iran's involvement. So I Bill, put it this way. I've got 100 questions for you. So, so they're all, they're all, I mean, they're great. And we have more. Did you know this is a live question audience today too, Bill? Uh, yes, yes. I'm looking forward okay, to that. Okay, good. Okay. So we're going to get there. Okay. So I have all of those things, but I want to ask you this first. You and I did a video, a DVD series on pre-tribulation prophecies. Both of, I'm going to ask you something that gets me in hot water and probably you, because we, we have a, a take on some of the things that, that are frankly, are, I would say, have a very good possibility of happening before Daniel's covenant is even confirmed. You know, so when I look at some things, you know, we have a rap, the rapture, and then we have these other events. So I know this stirs up the, the pot, but that's okay with me because I think people need to be able to think through the process and what the Bible actually does say. And sometimes we just take traditional Bible prophecy teaching and say, well, that's it, without studying any further. Um, so I like to look at things further. You like to look at things a lot further and really dig up and say, well, what does the Bible actually say? So through the pre-tribulation prophecies, can you explain what that is? That's the video, the series we did. And then uh, what you see uh, happening, what we could experience, I, I would say. Absolutely. You know, Tom, the pre-tribulation prophecies are prophecies that some of them, the church age, we put this forward in the prophetic documentary we did. Actually, the church could witness these, depending on if the Lord tarries in the rapture event, which is imminent. It, that could happen at any given time. And, and we make that point, make that case strongly in the DVD that, the rapture could happen at any given time but if it doesn't happen before some of these other prophecies it could happen and i'm going to rifle them off there's about 20 of them i'm going to say someone real quickly we anticipate a disaster in iran jeremiah chapter 49 the destruction of damascus there'll be a toppling of jordan in jeremiah 49 verse 2 and zephaniah 2 terrorization of egypt in isaiah 19 and we'll talk about egypt also in joel 319 and ezekiel 29 that desolation you're talking about uh, I believe that would trigger into, at some point, the Psalm 83 war, the inner circle of Arab countries surrounding Israel. Uh, Israel's exceedingly great army is going to emerge. They're already great, but they're going to be exceedingly great when they take out Damascus and other things. Israel's going to expand territorially a little bit, incrementally, not into all the promised land, but in the aftermath of these wars. The rapture, uh, emergence of a greater Israel, because Israel, Russia's going to invade a greater, safer Israel, dwelling securely. I, we talk about the decline of the of America. Uh, its best days are behind it. Russia invades Israel, Ezekiel 38. Unrestrained supernatural deception that comes when the hinderer is taken out in 2 Thessalonians. The arrival of the Antichrist, because he's got to be on the scene for the false covenant to be confirmed. Uh, you know, we may even have wars, famines, plagues, depending where the seal judgments happen. I know, Tom, mm -hmm. so, most of the traditionalists put the seal judgments in the first half of the tribulation. You and I make an argument that, hey, maybe the first five seal judgments may actually happen in the gap. There's a there's a post-rapture, pre-tribulation gap because it happens after the rapture, mm -hmm. but before the tribulation, because it's not the rapture that starts the tribulation. It's a confirmation of the false covenant. There'll be a harlot world religion, 144,000 Jewish evangelists, an overflowing scourge that you I know you've talked a lot about on your show. Uh, you know, the, the Jewish temple is going to be probably, I think, part of the false covenant draft. So, Tom, I mean, we're talking about a lot of very powerful world-changing events mm -hmm. that could happen in advance of the tribulation itself. Yeah, in fact, I would say, when I look at it, um, much of that, I would think will happen before the tribulation. And I know that that bothers some people, but there are some prophecies that are definitely related to the last days. The problem that so many people have when it comes to the pre-tribulation uh, rapture, which both you and I are pre-trib rapture, the problem is it's been put into a context for decades that, that, that there'll be nothing that anybody's going to experience prior to the tribulation, prior to the to the uh, rapture taking place or so forth. And then none of the events will happen until after the tribulation begins. But we could see lots of things happen um, prior to the rapture. We could still see things happen. And then after the rapture, like you're saying, before the tribulation begins, 
All kinds of things could happen. You know, James Cadiz and I have talked about that also. He heard some things that you were saying, so we got into the five seals. You know, you look at the, the five seals, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and then you take the fifth seal with the, the people that are martyred during the tribulation period. Uh, you take them and you start putting them into the context. Well, where does these fit? Because they, in my mind, Bill, when I look at the five seals, the first five, they're, they, they work out differently than the rest of the judgments, the trumpet judgments and the bull judgments. Um, so I, I just, I find it all very fascinating. Um, you, you mentioned many things in what you were just saying. One of them was the scourge of Isaiah chapter 28, which I think often gets completely overlooked or just missed by a lot of people when they're looking at Bible prophecy. Uh, you and I both talked about it before, but Isaiah 28 is the time when uh, Jerusalem was led by wicked leaders and they enter into a covenant with death and shul to avoid the scourge. But God says, I'll annul your covenant and you're not going to, going, going to annul this. You're not going to avoid the scourge anyways. So when you look at that in a nutshell, where, how do you, what do you place that as and what would be the, what's your concept of the possibility of what the scourge is that the leaders of Jerusalem try to avoid, but they're unable to avoid it? Right. That's the tough question about what are the scornful rulers in Jerusalem in Isaiah 28, 14, who make this covenant. What are they concerned about that they feel they, the need to covenant? The verse says that the people who rule in Jerusalem, the scornful leaders, Isaiah 24 and 15, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves so we we've got some concepts here we've got to figure out we've got to put a face on death and sheol who do they represent they happen to turn up as the fourth horseman death and hades and the tribulation so they appear to be one of the parties to the covenant because we're told in isaiah 28 that the covenant is made with death and sheol they they do arrive as does the white horseman the confirmer of the covenant on the first horse he comes on the scene as in the first seal of judgment as the white horseman Israel's on the scene. So you have one of the parties to the covenant. You have the confirmer of the covenant. We're told Daniel 9.27, he confirms the covenant. But is the other party, is the overflowing scourge happening at that time of the revealing of the white horseman of the Antichrist? I suggest probably not. And I believe that when you get down to the fourth horseman, which is death in Hades, Sheol is the Greek Hebrew word for Hades is the Greek word. Uh, I believe they can either stop some overflowing scourge or they're actually perpetrating that overflowing scourge. And that's why Israel wants to make a covenant with them. And what is death and Hades doing if they are the other party? Well, they have court, uh, authority or power over a court of the earth to kill. And they're killing a lot of people. And, and some people say they're killing a court of the earth. I personally translate that as they have authority over a court of the earth to kill a lot of people. I see that as a mass network. Uh, probably the, could be the Harlow World Religion. I make that argument in, in the DVD and elsewhere. Uh, but whoever it is, they're perpetrating a massive killing spree. And we find out in the fifth seal, some of the people that are killing among the dissenters are Christians, the fifth seal saints. And they ask this question, how long, O oh Lord, will this continue until you avenge our blood? In other words, why are they asking that question, Tom? That's a key question. If they were in the tribulation, they could actually calendar the days, a seven-year tribulation, how many more months or years would be left in that process of time? And God says something interesting. He says, you must rest a little while longer until the number of your fellow servants and their brethren will be you know, killed like you or martyred like you. In other words, there's three different groups he's pointing out in the, in the I believe, in the gap on through the tribulation of Christian martyrs. The fellow fifth seal saints, I believe, could die in the gap. That's why they don't know how long until they're avenged. Mm -hmm. Their fellow servants, who I believe, uh, could die in the first half of the tribulation. And then the brethren and fellow servants, I believe, could have, die in the second half of the tribulation. Now, of course, Tom, that's on the DVD, and it's I'm not sure that's exactly what the timing is and the groupings are, but I, I suspect that's what the Lord is saying to the fifth of saints. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna really throw some monkey wrenches in there now, and uh, because th this will be this will be great conversation. People will get mad at me just for asking it. You ready? <laughs> so, so the white horse uh, you mentioned. Um, represents antichrist so uh, let me ask you this why do you think that the white horse represents antichrist well that is what's commonly taught it's one of the first things that ha his revealing is one of the first things that happened 
after the rapture and we're told after the hindrance in second thessalonians that the satan through signs and lying wonders will uh the lawless one will emerge at that point so the timing would be fitting there um he and this is commonly taught by the way uh that the white horseman is the uh the antichrist he he rides down on a white horse he's He's coming here with a, to, to conquer and conquering and to conquer, which is we know the Antichrist has got a threefold career. He's got a, a political career because he's going to broker a peace deal with Israel. Israel will respect them, respect him like the, they trusted Jimmy Carter to broker a peace deal with Egypt and Bill Clinton to broker a peace deal with Jordan. They will trust this guy. They will have com confidence in him that he can stand behind this covenant. Uh, he's got a, he's going to become a military leader because we find on Daniel 11, he's waging and winning lots of wars. And then we find out he's going to be a supreme religious leader because ultimately he wants the whole world to worship him in Revelation chapter 13. So that, that particular white horseman, uh, some people confuse that with Jesus Christ who rides a white horse, but this, this is not him. This is, a, in my estimation, commonly taught with our colleagues and traditionally, this is the Antichrist coming in on the white horse. So I would, I, I agree, he's definitely not Jesus Christ, but I uh, did a video recently on the white horse, and I proposed out there, whatever this, whoever this white horse is, or whatever he represents, I said, uh, when you look at the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel's very clear that the kingdom that's coming, this, this final new world order is very crushing, very demanding, um, and you look at the white horse, of Revelation chapter 6. It goes about conquering and to conquer. It has a bow with no arrows representing it's, it's going to be conquering through, through laws, through rules, through regulations, through whatever it is. So um, it could be peace it, it, you also, but it seems to be dip, diplomacy, rules, regulations, and so forth. So when you look at what's happening right now with the leaders of the world, they are definitely conquering and crushing and devastating people through the rules and regulations that they are bringing and the more that they want to bring through climate. So what I did, Bill, is I threw it out there and said, understand that this rider on the white horse, whoever he is or whoever he represents, it's not about war that is that this is bringing. The war is going to come with the second horse, but you look at this, and, and um, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, and I did say, I did say this, Bill. I said, tradition teaches, it's commonly taught that the rider on the white horse is Antichrist. I'm not so sure that the rider on the white horse is necessarily Antichrist. I do believe this, though, Bill, that the rapture takes place before the confirmation of the covenant uh, of Daniel chapter 9. I, I'm convinced it does, pre-trib and it's the 70th week of Daniel, but I'm just, you know, I, I seem to be the only one I know that's saying this right now. I'm just not confident the writer on the white horse is Antichrist. Don't, it doesn't mean he's not, but I, but I see the system of the beast coming with the rider of the white horse. And that's really what, what I observe that, that I am confident of. It's the system of the Antichrist that is going to be coming into this world. Right. That particular, you know, Revelation 6, 1 and 2 is where most of our colleagues and traditional, you know, commentaries would put the emergence and revealing of the Antichrist. Yeah. Um, and that's where they say, because of that, that's where they gravitate towards. That must be when the covenant gets confirmed and starts the seven year tribulation. Right. And, you know, we put on the DVD, we say, well, wouldn't it have been nice if it said, uh, let me see if I've got it right here in front of me. He goes, now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living preachers saying, and, and he said unto me, therefore, when you see the prince who is to come, confirm the covenant, which is the Greek word diatheki, the only word that could be used for the false covenant in, in the Greek. When you see the covenant between Israel and many, as spoken by Daniel the prophet, then you will know that the 70th week has begun. And we kind of get a chuckle out of that because that's, that's Revelation 6 wishful thinking. We don't have that detail. But diatheki, it shows up 33 times in the New Testament, and it can only be the word that it needed to be fitted in there if we're going to really gravitate on. That's where the false covenant gets confirmed. It's not in there. Yeah. So it's, in my estimation, it's speculation. That's where the tribulation starts. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I look, Bill, and so you, this is the other thing you have. Um, it, it, this is total speculation. I'll admit it. But you have the first four seals, which I want to get to another question because I get this often. Uh, the seals are not called judgments. You have bowl judgments and trumpet judgments. The seals aren't called judgments. Uh, but nevertheless, I want to come back to that in a minute. Um, when I look at the first four horsemen, 
you have great destruction that's going to be on the planet. Certainly cr a crushing empire is rising up. Um, you have war. You have this famine, this this economic catastrophe. You have the pale horse that shows up that you, you, you say has a, a power to kill a quarter of the earth. Um, I tend to lean towards it does take out a quarter of the earth, but I totally get what you're saying. So ever since you said that to me, you know, I, I realized, you know, maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe it's just that power to do that. Um, but nevertheless, you have these things happening. I see Antichrist coming on the scene after the four horsemen simply having the answers. Hey, I've got the answers to this problem. Here's the problem. You got these Christians these people who are coming to faith in Christ. Rapture's already taken place. So uh, I'm saying people who come to faith after the rapture, they're going to be Christians during the tribulation period. So don't put me into the not pre-trib category, pre-trib rapture category. But the people coming to faith after the, the seals happen, um, Antichrist, I could easily see him on this, coming on the scene. He's going to appear smarter, more charismatic. He's going to be able to work signs and wonders. He's going to be remarkable. He's going to have this ability to confirm a covenant, a peace with Israel, with Jerusalem and the many other nations. And I believe he's also going to have a lot of answers to the world's solutions. You know, we, are, we hear about digital currency now and so forth. We know that's coming. Revelation chapter 13 certainly paints a picture that no one can buy or sell unless they receive the mark of the beast. So we have the database. All those things are already in place. But I can see Antichrist easily coming on the scene after the first four seals saying, here's the problem. I can fix it. And by the way, these people that are believers in Christ, they're part of the problem. Hence, you have the fifth seal martyrs too. So you know, I, I look at that. and and uh, But again, you know, I, it, it's, it, there is this concept that the rapture takes place immediately after the rapture, it, the tribulation begins. But I agree with you, Bill. It's, the rapture takes place, but the tribulation does not begin until Daniel's covenant. That's what kicks off the tribulation. I think a lot of people get confused on that. Well, correct. And, and some of the prophecies we talked about, uh, a lot of them were dealing with the Israeli defense forces, um, taking out Damascus. Uh, we talk about them, Jordan, it says it'll be a alarm of war in Rabah, the Ammonites in, Rabah, in Jeremiah 49.2. Uh, it will be a desolate mound, it says, and that's the capital of Jordan, Amman, Jordan. Uh, and Israel will take possession of its inheritance. In other words, Israel is going to win a war and move in. Uh, Zephaniah 2, 8 and 9 also give details from a different camera angle about that same thing. Uh, so when you look at the wars involved with Israel, and we point out there's quite a few of them uh, in the pre-tribulation, they, they have to be pre-tribulation because the Israeli defense forces in the tribulation are not winning wars and fighting. In other words, in the first half of the tribulation, mm. they're living in this peace where they're not, mm. you know, they feel that they've secured peace. And they're, they're so complacent at that point, they can't even stop the Antichrist from going into the temple at the midpoint of the tribulation and doing the abomination and desolation. And then even Jesus Christ says in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination and desolation, he says to flee immediately to the Jewish people because the Antichrist at that point is going to try to commit a campaign of genocide. And in Zechariah 13, 8, we find out that two-thirds of the Jews will be cut off in the land. So the Israeli defense forces in the beginning are not fighting wars, they're waging wars of the first half of the tribulation. In the second half, they're fleeing for their lives. I mean, they may try to fight a little bit, but it would be disastrous for them. So that those anything related to the Israeli defense forces in prophecy that has not found fulfillment historically, that is still impending, it's not going to happen in the millennium. It's not going to happen in the tribulation. It's got to happen between mm. in the pre-tribulation scenario. That that is one of the best observations I've ever heard. That is outstanding. I, I you know I know you and I've had many conversations before, but when you put it into that understanding, yeah. So why would we not expect to see certain things happen? Do you think this the Battle of Damascus um, could happen before the Rapture? Well, you know, again, we caveat that. Any, no, nothing needs to have, happen before the rapture. Uh, I personally think that that Middle East, those Arab countries and the peripheral prophecies with the wars that I think actually culminate in the final conclusion of Psalm 83, mm -hmm. I believe those could happen before the rapture, Tom. Yeah. I think the, those could happen. Uh, with, the world will start turning more of an, giving it more of an ear to Bible prophecy and then I think the rapture happens, and then Ezekiel 38 happens. There's reasons Ezekiel 38 
the church does not need to be here. Three times it's mentioned, it's my people Israel, God's referring to them as Israel. He's going to make his holy name known through his people Israel. Now, of course, dear viewers slash listeners, uh, this is just my educated guests and i certainly don't know that this is the timing and the way these things are going to happen but yes tom we could wake up soon and we could see that jeremiah 49 dealing with that elam prophecy mm -hmm. which i believe is a nuclear prophecy dealing with part of iran that part that hugs the persian gulf uh with which our nuclear reactor is uh could happen and remember syria is one of iran's proxies and so it says ball up in lebanon we got to get back to that question about lebanon um we could see that a war starts to break out that is not necessarily Psalm 83, that is not necessarily Ezekiel 38, uh, that does actually involve Syria coming against Israel, maybe shooting chemical weapons in there. That Isaiah prophecy, Tom, you've talked about it on your show, we got it on the DVD. It actually involves uh, some trouble for Israel, it looks yeah, it like. It looks like Israel actually takes a hit. It says, uh, that it says that in Isaiah 17, 4 through 6, which are critically important verses, it says that in that day when Damascus is destroyed, the glory of Jacob will fade. It'll be the fatness of his flesh will become lean. It says it'll be like the shaking of an olive tree, and only two or three olives will be left in the uppermost branch, four or five in the branches. Picturing an olive tree over Israel, we, we do the slide on the DVD, uh, which can ultimately hold, it can grow up about 50 feet, and it can hold about a half a million olives on it. And there's a picture of a shaking that's going on, and literally only two or three olives are left up in the upper mm. northern part of Israel. And, and and the Israel becomes it's, it fades it's, it becomes lean. I think that Israel gets hit by two thousand missiles a day from Hezbollah, thousand plus a day coming in from Hamas, chemicals coming in from Syria. Israel's been preparing for all this recently in massive war drills, evacuate. They recently testing evacuating cities in, in the north on a major drill, preparing for this very thing we're talking about. This is not something that, you know, a figment of our imagination. Israel is preparing for this war right now, and it could come right at them. And real soon, and we could wake up when, watching this war, and we could wake up seeing the Damascus destroyed soon, Tom, maybe even before the elections. Because think about this. I know a lot of Americans are going, well, maybe the Republican Party will get a kick revival at the elections next year in November. And I, I asked the question, well, how many nuclear weapons could Iran have by next November at the rate it's, rate it's going right now? It's already enriching up to 60%. The answer technically should be zero because Israel won't allow that. And if Israel won't allow that, that means there's a military conflict that's probably impending that could have epic and prophetic consequences. Wow, Bill, that was that was fantastic. Uh, that's very insightful, just the thought process. You know, watching the military games that Israel's been doing lately, just practicing you bringing that into this, what is really going on? You know, so when it comes to this person asked me this question about Lebanon, the, the I mean, all those missiles that they're threatening through Hezbollah and Iran, uh, Iran is basically calling the shots over there, aren't they? With, with these terror groups. I mean, we have Russia involved, uh, which I want to ask you about Russia in a minute. Well, let's answer the Lebanon one, okay. and uh, then we'll move on to the, the questions. You know, Lebanon, which regained its Arab statehood in 1943, is interesting. It's not in Ezekiel 38, which is surprising because, you know, that's Iran's proxies. One of their top proxies is Hezbollah. And the Ezekiel 38 invasion comes from the uttermost parts of the north, meaning it will sweep through Lebanon. So, and you don't see it by any of its ancient names of Tyre, Gabal, or Sidon. Um, however, two of those, Tyre and Gabal, actually show up in Psalm 83, and both those places exist currently. Tyre is uh, to the south of Beirut. It's one of the bigger cities closest to Haifa on the mm -hmm. southwest Mediterranean coast. And Gabal is ancient, is now Biblos, which is about 23 miles north of Beirut. So we've got these two uh, uh, populations covered in, pretty much northwest and southwest meaning pretty much the broader scope of lebanon in bible prophecy and it's interesting that among the 10 identified groups in psalm 83 only two populations are listed in the habitation condition one of them is the tents of edom meaning edomite descendants and, and i'm going to translate it in my view so people don't have to believe this but the edomites have ethnical representation in the palestinians today and tents of tend to represent a refugee condition biblically speaking the inhabitants of tyre are listed in psalm 83 verse 7 so they're the other com, uh, population listed in a habitation condition so what we have and if you look at the hebrew word for inhabitants in in it's yeshab in the in the hebrew in the Strong's Dictionary and the, the NSAB translation, 
It can mean inhabitants, but it can also mean to convene, to be put in place, to lie in ambush, to haunt, lurking occupiers that are reposed and resettled to rule. So I would say in a paragraph paraphrasing, this implies that when Psalm 83 finds fulfillment, there will be refugees with Edomite descent, who will actually be as a lead group because they're listed first, so the, their, it's their plight that's being bannered. And also that just perhaps that there's a lurking, haunting, resettled, reposed, purposely put in place occupiers in Ty, Tyre, named, namely the Hezbollah. Now that's kind of a Bible study there, but my point is Lebanon is in Bible prophecy. And I think when Syria goes down, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead, Arab countries are going to go, wow, look, they, Israel just took out um, an Arab city. What's to say they won't take out Beirut, where Hezbollah is up in that area? What's to say they won't take out Amman, Jordan? And they actually do take out Amman, Jordan, in Jeremiah 49, too. What's to say they won't take out Mecca or Cairo, right? Mm -hmm. And and by the way, Israel's hurt right now. They're 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 way, they're faded. Their flesh has become lean. You know, we can take them now. I think that would then trigger probably the final conclusion of Psalm 83. I think Psalm 83 showed its hints of it happening in 1948, but it wasn't the final fulfillment because all those countries of Psalm 83 were involved in the 1948 war. Wow, that's very fascinating. Uh, I, I, Bill, this is great, just great having you on. I can't wait ha to have you back in a few weeks. I'm speaking to Bill Salas for all of you who can't see, and we only have audio available today. Um, but before we take the first question, um, let me uh, just, you have some of these, what's some of the things that you have coming up, some of the projects you have coming up, DVDs, books, anything, and how can people get them, including the DVD, the, the prophetic uh, documentary that you and I did, including that. How can people get these things? Well, let's start with that, Tom. That is an incredible work, very timely work right now. Uh, it's available. I, I, I think you're getting it in your bookstore, but I've, we've got it on uh, prophecydepot.com. And uh, that's prophecydepot.com. That's our website. It's available there. We're selling a lot of those. A lot of those were sold through Prophecy Watchers as well, Prophecy News Watch. I've uh, got a new DVD. I've got a book out now, new book, and a new DVD that goes with it's coming out on December 1st called The Millennium Prophecies and the New Jerusalem. One of the most encouraging prophecy books you can get. And that's going to be also available. Uh, pre orders already on my website. Uh, got a new DVD coming out from, produced by Prophecy Watchers. Most exhaustive work on Ezekiel 38, three discs called Ezekiel 38, when God uh, defends Israel. Uh, I'm we're putting the subtitle together now. Uh, that is with Mondo Gonzalez and I. We cover everything on that. And that's coming out in December. Uh, who are the participants, the 15 participants? How does the battle go? How does the Lord stop it? What's the motives? What happens in the aftermath of the burning of the weapons and things like that? So. Uh, we got those three big things coming up in December and on into January, and then we got a, another bunch of campaigns coming up into 2022. That's fantastic, and everything's available. Prophecy Depot, which is your your ministry, right? Prophecydepot.com. Prophecy Depot, like Home Depot.com. That's that's fantastic, and if you forget that, just Google Bill Salas, and you'll be able to find it that way too. You can also send me a note, and I can I can connect you with with Bill. So you're ready for some questions. I am, Tom. Okay. This first one comes from Alicia Cardenas. Question, if we come to understand that the white horseman is the system of the Antichrist, does it seem likely that Revelation 10, verses 5 through 7, via the mystery of God of Romans chapter 16, verse 25, and 1 Corinthians 15, 50, I think sometimes we can read a little bit too much into some passages, so I wouldn't see that. Uh, let me read what, what Revelation chapter 10 is first uh, before we go to the next question, uh, Alicia. Re Revelation chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, uh, simply says this, Bill. Uh, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. So listen, this is, this is, you know, I've taught through Revelation chapter 10 uh, many times before. And so I don't really see that connection with Romans 16 or 1 Corinthians 15. Um, uh, Bill, you probably can't see these questions, can you? No. Okay. Um, let's go, let's take some more questions here. If you could scroll through that, uh, Matthew, that would be great. Um, thank you. Here's one. This comes from, uh, where to go? Uh, the people, this from uh, Tim Handy, the people that survive the tribulation, that go through the millennium, do they receive a glorified body at the end of the millennium? What do you uh, think, Bill? 
you know, that's an interesting question because the sheep Gentiles who become believers after the rapture through the periods of Christian martyrdom, the fifth seal saints, their fellow servants and their brethren, somehow there's people who do survive though. And it's going to be, there'll be quite a few of them actually, although it's kind of surprising. How did they make it? And in Matthew 25, they have that judgment, uh, the sheep and goat judgment, Gentile, Gentile judgment. And the goats, of course, are cast into Hades at that time, and but the sheep go into the millennium and they populate it with their sin natures. They saw their sin natures, but they're saved. And Christ will rule with the rod of iron, we're told, for that thousand years uh, because of that sin nature. But uh, the re there'll be resurrected Old Testament saints will be on the scene coming in the 75 day interval. They resurrected the resurrected tribulation saints. Of course, the church will have been resurrected at the rapture. Um, but when did the millennial saints? get uh immortal reach immortality because we talk of there's an age of accountability isaiah 65 20 says that the child will live to be 100 mm -hmm. but the sinner will be accursed at, so there's an age of accountability in the millennium but by the time it's all said and done they will have immortal bodies um and i believe that if it hasn't happened during the millennium it'll happen in the aftermath age which comes between the eternal order after the millennium that's of course when you have the white throne judgment you have satan released from the abyss and that secondary Magog invasion in Revelation 20. Mm -hmm. Then you have the eternal order when the new Jerusalem comes down with the new heaven and the new earth. So to answer the question, um, we're not really told when they, the sheep Gentiles, the, the millennial saints receive their immortal bodies, but ultimately they'll have to go into the eternal order. Yeah, eventually they will. I would think it's going to have to be at the end of the millennial kingdom. Uh, maybe, you know, when, when God creates the new heavens and the new earth, Maybe at that point, they're going to have to have their new body before that happens because uh, they would need to be able to have a different body to be able to survive. Uh, what Peter describes is how the new heaven and the new earth are going to be built by the Lord. So, uh, But definitely, they don't have their, their um, new body going into the millennium because they're the ones that populate the planet. And you already mentioned how long they're going to be living during that time. Um, uh, can you scroll through some more questions, please? Thank you very much. Uh, question, this comes from Kathy Hidalgo. Who are the 144,000? Well, they show up in Revelation 7 as evangelists uh, with the seal of God on them. They're protected. Uh, they become God's witnesses, evangelists, after the, among the, the two witnesses are also on the scene too in Revelation 11. But they become God's main evangelists on the world scene at that time they're all from they're jewish they come from the 12 different 12 tribes of israel you can find that in revelation 7 1 through 7 i believe it is and uh they're going to be probably like you know paul i mean paul was a strong jew you could have some of these guys probably alive today could be tour guides in israel that know more about the new testament than the christians uh they could be hebrew scholars at the hebrew university or something like that but when when, when god seals them for service they get left behind, they get sealed for service, and they will go on the scene and have an incredible job because they do an incredible job of evangelizing because we find out at the end of Revelation 7 that there's a multitude that can't that you can't even put a number on of people who get saved and come out of the Great Tribulation. So uh, these guys are very, very effective. Yeah, amen. In fact, I think it's Revelation chapter 14 that says they are the first fruits of the tribulation at least that's what the implication is from revelation 14 so it's fascinating to watch also these are they're all men uh they're virgins we know they're all men because it tells us they didn't know a woman uh, that's how they're described uh, so they're people that are definitely they're jews and they are set apart um and i i think also bill that these 144,000 aren't necessarily going to be uh just from Israel. They could be Jews from anywhere in the world, can't they? Yeah, and I believe that will be the case. And, and by the way, there's some different arguments as to whether they're virgins. The context okay. of, of that talk about them, they'll have no regard, in, in some translations, they'll have no regard for the one, the God beloved by women. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean he's a virgin when you look at the context of that. Okay, that's great. Great to know. I, I didn't know that till you just pointed that out. I love learning things. I like to think I know everything, but I don't. So my wife tells me I think I know everything. Can you believe that? <laughs> okay, here's a question for you. This is one that I had. So I'm going through Joel chapter three. Uh, I finished it. I started Hosea. I'm going through the minor prophets on Sunday evenings. Now California time, Sunday evenings. And this is in Joel chapter three and uh, verses 18 through 
21, the Bible says this, And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk. This is talking about the, the millennial kingdom. Um, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord, a water and water the valley of the acacias. And then here, this is, I'm curious about this, Bill. Uh, verse 19, but Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall abide forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I had not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So the context of it, Bill, to me, is speaking of the millennial kingdom, but yet God separates Egypt and Edom, and he says, you know, it's like not so fast for Edom and Egypt, I'm going to deal with them. Is that all in the context of the beginning of the millennial kingdom, or, or how do you see that? Yeah, I see that in his millennial, I see that in the beginning of the millennium. I want to I want to spend more time on the Egypt thing in a moment, but okay. I do want to tell you that. Remember, Isaiah 11 tells us the whole world in the millennium will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, and part of that knowledge of the Lord is going to be looking at the geography that's around there. Edom and Babylon, we're told, in millennial Babylon in Isaiah 13 is going to be. Uh, it's no Arabian no pitches tents there. It'll be a desolate place for doleful creatures, etc. Satires. But Edom will be likewise. It'll be the two places we're told in Isaiah 34. I think it is on Edom. Hold on. Yeah, Isaiah 34. It'll be turned into pitch and dust and brimstone. And it'll be uninhabitable for, throughout the generations. So Edom, which is in southern Jordan, Babylon, which is in modern day Iraq, these two places in the millennium will be, like it says, Egypt will be a desolation. Um, excuse me, Edom will be a desolation. But when we talk about the Egypt thing. This has become pretty active at this point in time because you got a couple of things dealing with Egypt. Egypt has a peace treaty with Israel that's very fragile, but we find out in Isaiah 19, it's an unfulfilled prophecy that something's going to happen in Isaiah 7, 16 through 19. Egypt's going to have a terror by Israel. It'll be terrorized by Israel. And there'll be a, it looks like there'll be a war. And it'll be, it'll be fearful like a woman, which Egypt, after the wars they've had in 48, 67, and 73, has become fearful of Israel. That's why they have a peace treaty and it says that after that war the five cities in the language in the land of egypt will speak the language of canaan which is hebrew so i believe that's possibly referring to the fact that israel will win a war and move into that territory which part of that is part of the promised land but more importantly there's another thing that happens doesn't totally desolate egypt because and I, the antichrist goes into egypt in isaiah excuse me uh daniel chapter 11 and we find out that he's going to probably be responsible for Egypt going into 40 years of desolation. And we turn our attention to e Ezekiel 29 and it says uh, that there'll be neither foot nor man shall pass. And this is verse 11 through 12, etc. No foot will pass through, no beast in Egypt for to be uninhabited for 40 years. It's going to be a desolation. He says, I will make Egypt a land desolate in the midst of the other countries that are desolate. And the cities will be laid desolate. And then he goes, the, the Egyptians will be dispersed out of the land scattered for 40 years during that 40 year period so if the antichrist is the one causing that because this has not found fulfillment yet and by the way when it says when egypt comes back in the land it'll be the lowliest of all kingdoms and that's in isaiah 29 or 30 excuse me ezekiel 29 or 30. um if the antichrist causes this desolation because it has to exist into the tribulation because that's when the antichrist goes down in, into egypt it looks like in daniel 11. That means that the 40 years of dispersion actually gravitates over, happens over the first part of the millennium, probably for the first three decades or so, so like that, which is amazing to think about that. But yes, Egypt will be a desolation mm -hmm. into the first part of the Messianic kingdom because of what the Antichrist does when it desolates. It has to be the Antichrist because, uh, you know, he's he's the last guy on the scene that we see going into Egypt in that Daniel 11. Uh very fascinating. Okay, I have another question that, that uh, to throw out there to you. Uh, we're, I know we're almost out of time. I did promise you short two questions. So one of them is regarding Ezekiel 38. Second one's going to be the rapture. Okay, on the first one regarding Ezekiel 38, uh, this was brought to my attention recently. Well, this question was brought up to me recently. And I said, well, I'm going to ask Bill what he thinks about it. I gave my answer. I'd like to know what you know. And, and the, the person said this because I've taught that the Ezekiel 38 battle will happen early on in the tribulation period. However, what he said fits with 
a gap theory. I'll tell you why. Because he said, well, it seems to me that the Ezekiel 38 battle, if it happens before the tribulation period, it has to happen at least three and a half years before. He said, here's why. Because when Antichrist sits in the temple and demands to be worshipped as God at the midpoint of the tribulation period, well, at that point, the Jews are fleeing. They are not staying, burning the weapons in Israel because Ezekiel 39 says they're going to be burning the weapons for seven years. So that means they would have to be done burning the weapons by the midpoint of the tribulation period. And um, I said, well, let me see what Bill thinks. I know what, what my guess is. So curious, your thoughts on that. Yes, exactly. I'm trying. I'm getting to the verse for a second. There's something I want to say on that. Okay. Well, first of all, that person is quoting things that he could have heard from Ron Rhodes, myself, okay. Dr. Ron Fruchtenbaum, stuff like that. In other words, the timing clue is is there that the burning of the weapons is, and I believe that's converting them to fuel, is is for a seven year period of time. By the way, America has already learned how to convert Russian nuclear weapons into energy, uh, so I'm sure Israel has that same ability. Uh, I've got headlines on that in the Millennium book, I believe, I've got it, the Final Prophecies book. But nonetheless, they could burn weapons for three and a half years before the tribulation, convert them to fuel. And in that peaceful period, in the first three and a half years, they could certainly convert them to fuel. And it says, by the way, when they're burning the dead and burning, converting the weapons to fuel, they're burning the dead for seven months, they're converting the weapons for fuel. It says Israel gains world renown during, when this happens. So uh, I believe, you know, at the midpoint of the tribulation, they're going to be fleeing for their lives, grabbing a weapon to use it on their way to Petra Jordan rather than converting weapons to fuel. Hmm. No, go ahead. Yeah, well, no, I just, no, uh, that's, that's great. But while you're talking, this, this, I just came across this question that came in. It was a statement. Okay. You ready for this? This is from yeah. Don Perkins. Apparently, he doesn't like something I said. Hey, Don, I, sorry about that. So, so Don Perkins says, yes, uh, this is Don Perkins. The rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. So, so, I'll, I'll, uh, so hey, Don, it's great to have you join us. Um, it's, so, fantastic to have you. Thank you, Don, for joining Bill Salas and myself. I look forward to having that conversation with you on a Monday, too. I'm still waiting for you to give me that date, Don Perkins. Okay, Bill, I, I, the rapture, you say you think it could happen at any moment? I do. Um, before I answer that question, <clears throat> we're going to take a couple minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a horse throat here. Um, I do want to go back to the Antichrist saying, you know, that Don Perkins okay. is talking about there. Um, remember that the Antichrist, one of the first things he does when he comes on the scene is he forms this unholy alliance between with himself and Mystery Babylon, the harlot world religion. We're said that the harlot rides the beast in Revelation 17, 3, I think it is, and that he carries her to her heights in Revelation 5 or 7. I, I'm not sure exactly what passage by memory. So they're involved. And in, in initially, the Antichrist is fil fulfilling a subservient role. He's playing second fiddle, while the harlot world religion comes into its uh, emerges on the scene. And she's drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, we're told in Revelation 17, 6. Ultimately, the 10 kings desolate the harlot in Revelation 17, 16, and give all of their power and all of her wealth and everything into the hands of the Antichrist, who in Revelation 13, we find out, and, and Revelation 20 as well, he actually starting to behead those who don't take the mark of the beast. That's part of the Christian martyrdom period. Now, the question I would have for you, Tom, mm -hmm. is if you think it's a system, the White Horseman, and the Antichrist could come on, at some time on the road between, you know, the first five seals or something like that, I'd like to know where you actually put him on the scene in, in the book of Revelation. That'd be yeah. important thing to find. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Uh, I believe, uh, like I said, you he's not, uh, the tribulation doesn't begin till the confirmation of Daniel's covenant. So with that, if going with what you're saying, we have the rapture, then a gap, th a gap time, which I agree with you on the gap period, um, it could be any time after the rapture that the confirmation of the covenant is brought about. I'm just saying, why does it have to be at the time of the rider or the white horse? I could see it easily taking place after the fourth seal when he confirms the covenant. He's, he's got the answers to the world's problems. Because when you have the rider on the white horse, 
Okay, so if the rider on the white horse is bringing peace, you have a bow without arrows, so he's not using military methods to conquer, though. He's definitely conquering, because it says going about conquering and to conquer. That's what he does. So I see rules, regulations, laws. The problem with that is after that comes the red horse, you have war, then you have the black horse, you have famine and economic collapse. Well, if Antichrist is the one bringing these things about, how's he going to win over the, the, the will of the people to say this guy's got all the answers when suddenly you have this major calamity that's broken up worldwide that's far worse than what we have now? I see Antichrist as being the one that comes on the scene with solutions, albeit lies and fake solutions, but solutions, charisma, he's got the answers to the problems that the globalists have created. So... When I put it in there, I don't have a specific time to put it in there. If I did put it in there, but I don't, you know, I, I don't have a. It happens right here. I believe it happens after the rapture, um, but exactly where I don't, uh, I couldn't tell you. Okay, I, I think we could agree on this though. Correct me if I'm wrong. That by the time we get into the sixth seal, when the wrath of the Lamb has come. We would have to think by that time he's on the scene and the wrath of the Lamb is coming, the tribulation started. Absolutely. I believe it's prior to the sixth seal. Um, yes. and, and I totally agree with that. But I do, and because of this thought process, there are a lot of people out there, my colleagues now, that think I'm not pre-trib rapture. Well, I'm still pre-trib rapture. I just don't know where to place Antichrist in the covenant because I know... I believe rapture happens first. After that, I think after that, you, we have all the pre-tribulation prophecies we've we've talked about in the DVD and so forth. There's great things on that. There's you you have great you have great things to say, Bill. It's been fantastic having you with me today. So I, listen, I've become a pre-gapper. I was a pre-tribber, now I'm a pre-gapper. I believe the tribulation happens before like, the game. You know what? I, that's what I'm going to do. When people ask me what I'm, I'm saying, I'm a pre-gapper. This thing could happen <laughs> 10 years before. It could happen way before. <laughs> I like that. I think I'll start doing that. Because I, I do see problems. It's not with the, the teaching of pre-trib rapture. It's, it's the problems of what people will see and experience. People, you know, people, you and I both know there's many people that believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Therefore, they think, well, you're never going to have persecution or never going to have suffering. Well, how do you get that out of, out of this? That's not what uh, the, the, the rapture teaching is about. You know, they misunderstand what the rapture, the purpose of the rapture, why God is doing it. We are going to, we're, we're not going to be here for the tribulation period. And and uh, but pre, I like that pre-gap rapture. So let's talk about the pre-trib rapture and that sort of thing. Do we have time? Um, do you have time? Yeah, I've got time. Okay, let me let me do this um, first. I, I got to thank people who are sending in their super chats. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate that. Any everything we do here is is strictly just by donations. Uh, the, this ministry is not supported by the church I pastor. Uh, it's completely separate. I really appreciate that. Also. Uh, Make sure you can connect with Bill at Prophecy Depot and also myself at HopeForOurTimes.com. That's my website. And uh, Bill, there's a prophecy conference in in uh, February or January. I get to speak at with with Jeff Kinley and Todd Hampson, and our buddy Don Perkins is, is going to be speaking at it too. So um, I'm looking forward to that. You have a lot of things coming up, also, don't you? Yeah, a lot of mainly just things dealing with those campaigns I talked about earlier. We're going to be doing a lot of media and things like that, probably generating more conferences and things from that. But mainly just doing a lot of promotional things with the Millennium Prophecies and DVD, the Pre-Trib Prophecies DVD, the Ezekiel 38 DVD, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a busy year, it looks like, at this point. Great. Okay. I've kept you on for 56 minutes. Is that okay if you 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 want to still talk? You said you want to say something about the rapture. We were talking about that. You still want to do it? Yeah, that was your question. Um, okay. So we're not appointed to the wrath. Let, let me go through, through a couple of real quick things here for the listener. You know, we're told in Romans 5, 8 through 9, that we are saved from this wrath through him, Jesus Christ. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 7 through 10, that we're not appointed to this wrath. For God did not appoint us to this wrath. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. It's Jesus who does that. And then Revelation 3, 10 is another good one. It says, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that comes to test those on the earth. 
And most Bibles would say, well, that's the period of time of the tribulation. And therefore, First Thessalonians 1, 4, verses, chapter 4, verses 18 is, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, so Tom, in short, in summary, you know, we, we understand the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb is starting at least by the sixth seal of judgment, we're told that. Now, we're told in Revelation 15, 1, that the, the seven last plagues of seven last bowl judgments and then the wrath of God is completed. So once we get into the sixth seal all the way through to the final bold judgment, the wrath of God is, is happening. And we're not appointed to that. So at least by the sixth seal, we've got to be out of here. And if, we, if, the, if the first five seals happen in the gap, which is something we're starting to speculate and wonder about, educational thinking about that, an alternative view to the timing of the seals, which, by the way, I get in all kinds of trouble for that alternative I, view. I, I and I warned you about that. You're going to get it, too. I'm, I'm getting so much trouble now from, it's mainly, <laughs> just, it's like, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm just working through this, and you start to study it more, and you go, okay, there, there's some interesting things that I think have been overlooked. But, yeah, I get in trouble. So, so we, we are, we're gone. I believe what happens because the church is in heaven and Revelation Three, four and five. We're on earth in the seven letters of the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. We're pictured in heaven in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. You don't hear from the church anymore until you get into Revelation 19. So verse chapter 6 to all the way 19. It all becomes about Israel and the judgments in the world and that sort of thing. Then all of a sudden the scroll is open and we're watching the scroll be open in Revelation chapter 5. And that's when these judgments start to come out. And, and then the question is, when does the tribulation start? We think, well, at least we're acknowledging it's got to start by the sixth seal judgment. Maybe the first seal, you know, what the traditional view is. I still teach that's a possibility. I, I'm leaning less toward that. But we're not here by the time the sixth seal judgment happens. We're not here by the time the first seal judgment happens. Because the church is taken up in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, in my estimation. This is one of the many arguments for a pre trib rapture. Yeah. And, and uh, ultimately... Um, also, this is the 70th week of Daniel, which the entire seven-year period is, the seven-year tribulation is, let alone a gap, which I believe I agree with you on. So it's the 70th week of Daniel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time when God turns his attention to the nation of Israel again. It's, it's changed. You know, that's, you know, one of the things that, that we point out that, uh, you know, we get pushed back on. But I think pretty much all pre-trib people are going to fall into the agreement with that. So, so, by the way, if Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens after the rapture, and if the second seal judgment is in the gap, uh, it would likely be that part of the wars on the earth, uh, the fiery red horsemen, maybe that would even involve Ezekiel 38. Well, I have said that before, that I, I, I could see the Ezekiel 38 war being the red horse. You know, and, and listen, I expect people to disagree with disagree with us on some things, but, uh, we, but you know, we press forward with the truth of Jesus Christ, and it's kind of fun to be able to use the opportunities to work out these different things in the Bible and cause people to think, think more clearly and thoroughly, I guess, of what the Bible actually says in certain places, and, and uh, it's, it's exciting to do. It was great to have you on today, too. Hey, Tom, thanks. I appreciate being on your show. I'm looking forward to it again, and I think on December 6th, if that's three, the day. Three weeks from today, and uh, that's going to be, I can't wait for it. Billy Crone, I have, I think I told you this, Billy Crone's going to be with me two weeks from today. And Don Perkins, I'm still waiting to hear from you when you're going to confirm. Um, so uh, so uh, anyways, it's wonderful having you. Have a great evening, Bill. Thank you very much for taking time with me, but also extra time. Um, and uh, I'll try to be more limited I'll try to be more respectful of your time next time when you're back here in three weeks. Well, I'll set aside an extra half hour just in right, case. Great. Oh, great. Hey, we'll have a good time. I know that. And so will our viewers. Thank you, Bill. God bless. All right, Tom. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope that you really enjoyed today. I'm, I'm certain that you did. And I uh, can't wait uh, for the next time. And Don Perkins, I'm still waiting to hear from you on this. God bless you all.